Yeah. Finger in. George Brooke Holt. Yeah, got to be like at least like 12 years old and be able to sing in order to sit by a drum. There are two. There are a porcupine. Second. So, uh, um. Oh, hey, yeah, you yeah. again. Oh, I'm back. I'm <laughs> um, you so, again. Uh, your, your name's Tom, right? I'm afraid so. And, uh, I, I, you've been, you know, involved in, uh, you know, fights kind of similar to this for a long time, right? Yeah. Can you describe a little bit of your background? How you got into doing this? I blame Winona LeDuc. I was just minding my own business. Mm -hmm. Damn. <laughs> no, I was, uh, um, Red Lake Nation mm -hmm. hired me for the solid waste officer. Mm -hmm. Uh, back in the early 1990s. A lot of the tribes in Indian country did not have uh, environmental protection programs, which was environmental racism issue. Why is it that the federal government, uh, since the early 70s, uh, provided uh, uh, funding and capacity for state governments to develop uh, their own state environmental protection programs and to to uh, develop their own laws and regulatory systems and what they call to receive delegated authority from the United States to operate their own state programs. So somehow in the early 70s they completely left out tribes. You know, so we have to really ask why did they leave, leave out tribes and all the millions and acres of land on the, on the lower 48 and then Alaska? That's because there's a lot of our indigenous territories are rich in natural resources, minerals and trees. Um, so, you know, my, my paranoia is that I don't think the government really wanted to have the tribes to develop really strong environmental protection programs. They wanted to be able to have a situation where these big multinational corporations could come in and basically open up contracts, mm -hmm. negotiate contracts. And there's no one to really advise the tribal leadership. Mm -hmm. So the states have somebody at least to advise them. So, um, a maximum um, of economic exploitation without any kind of accountability. Yeah, you put words in my mouth. I said that. Yeah, thank you. All right. <laughs> and, uh, so, uh, so that that became really a big issue in the early '90s. Mm -hmm. That there is a disproportionate amount of uh, uh, toxic waste and so on, toxic dumping and so mining in Indian country, and people of color. So there's the sort of Right. Back then, yeah. we found that there is racism and how federal law. These efforts are starting to make a difference. The things are starting to change. Well, just when you you make you have some successes in one issue, like my mom, she's she's Navajo, Arizona, and New Mexico. Um, it was our youth that formed an organization called Black Mesa Water Coalition, and uh, they started to focus on water and uh, the aquifer. <coughs> was being depleted by this decades of uh, mining of, of coal. And um, so uh, 
they had success in shutting down that mining company when they wanted to get a renewal of their permit to mine. It became a, a tribal issue. That's where the government stepped in because politically it was an issue they had to protect their water. So the sacredness of water became a big issue. Mm -hmm. But as soon as we have successes like that, there's another hot spot that pops up someplace else in North America <laughs> that we get involved and help communities you know, to have the knowledge and the capacity to get involved. We believe in the principle that indigenous people speak for themselves. So a lot of times they don't have information. A lot of times tribal leadership don't have information. So, so uh, it continues. Mm -hmm. Really, it does continue. Like the tar sands. This big operation, industrial complex called the tar sands. There's no intention of 20 corporations to shut the valve off. Uh, but you look at some environmental destruction. And it is destruction. If you ever go up there, you see the, the big open pit mines, the devastation to the water. There's the Athabasca River that flows right there. There's toxic holding ponds that are leaking into the river. And then the provincial government just hides it with glossy reports. You know, even the, the, the Canadian president, the prime minister, Stephen Harper, you know, he tries to hide the reality of the that human health, the human rights, ecological damages, <coughs> pollution of water, and the major contribution the of greenhouse gases. That's one of the contri contributors of uh, climate change. Canada is so down to kill the food. <laughs> but they have failed to fulfill the commitments of the Kyoto <laughs> Protocol because of the tar sands. Mm -hmm. So we're facing, we are facing an industrialized country that has no, it just really has no sensitivity and has no interest in protecting Mother Earth or protecting the rights of human people. Money is the bottom line. But we do try to, try to strategize how do we change that mentality. Yeah, and that's what I wanted to ask you. What, what kinds of strategies and tools can, can you bring to some community that you know, just has everything arrayed against it. What what seems to work? Well, the number one thing is for our native well, people to, to understand, understand and to have information. Because there's been too much of a pattern where we don't have full information. And then there's a lot of the <coughs> generation of <them. laughs> The whole generation of historical trauma. You, you overlay, you overlay all these different things are happening. Mm -hmm. Like for an example, some of my in-laws are from Red Lake. So the, I think the trees, you know, people know the trees, there's a relationship to trees. So you see trees, like, break down. I think there's some kind of psychological trauma, spiritual trauma to that. We haven't really figured out a feeling or a language for that. If we have historical trauma, that goes way back. But then we have these kind of issues, it triggers things. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's not just something that happens in a closed circle. There's cross cross cutting issues for a lot of our people. Mm -hmm. That's what I find all over. Whether it's out uh, west or north. One of the men here works with that historical trauma and healing. You know. And uh, you know that it it, 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 it festers inside here. Mm -hmm. and then have to deal with these things where we have to have confidence to step up and to speak out for something that, that we feel needs to be expressed. But after not only decades, but over 100 years of just being beat up, yeah. just being beat up literally by a governmental system that says, you have no voice, you know. Mm -hmm. you know that? So it's however the community defines that. Many of our communities, there's a fire. That's why this fire to revitalize this spirituality with the Holy Spirit, the blessings of Creator. So that gives us strength. We find that that's the foundation of strength for our people. Yeah. So, so, that, so that allows us to really to shut down some companies that happen in Montana. The uh, Zartman Mine, Gold Mine. I remember 
the company was just beating up the Grovan people and the Sinhoins at at, uh, at Lodgepole there. And uh, if you look at that mountain at Fort Belknap, some people have been to the powwow there at Hayes. It's right south of uh, uh, the agency. There's a little mountain there. You go up that creek between this like cliff. You go up there in the valley of the mountain. And they have a power up in there, a well-known power in Montana in the summertime. But all the sediment from that creek is uh, contaminated, cadmium, all this from the runoff from the mail, the, the mine tailings. If you look at the top of that mountain, it's going to cut off. Okay. So uh, when we were there for one of our Protecting Mother Earth gatherings, about 1,200 people came from all many tribes. And, uh, there's a medicine man there, named Joe Iron, and he speaks both the Cinnaboyne and he speaks Grovan. And uh, I remember he came and he asked all the people there, different tribes, bring out your bundles, bring out your your pipes, bring out whatever your your way of praying. He said, and come out. He says we'll have a meeting in about an hour. And there were a lot of people that came, brought out the sacred items and he conducted a ceremony so everyone prayed and put that spiritual power to strength you know? and uh, it was powerful you can feel it you can feel the back of your hair rise and goosebumps you know <coughs> many different denominations not only our own tribal ways but Christian ways too you know? everyone praying in their own way there's something happened after that. That was in August, and uh, right at the end of August that month, uh, something unexpectedly happened. Even the ones, the white enviros that had worked in mining issues, it surprised them. The company went bankrupt, just like that. Nice. And they had to close down that mining company, and that mine. They were even surprised. And uh, I believe it's the power of prayer that shut that shut down. Mm -hmm. yeah. So in our indigenous movement, it has a spiritual foundation. But also, we understand the white man politics. We understand economics, shareholders. So some of our, our tactics is to have shareholder campaigns. We go to where the annual general membership meetings are and we bring native people from the community to speak for themselves. Yeah. So all the shareholders want to know why are these Indians here? So we tell them why they're here. And a lot of them don't know that the company that they're a shareholder of is uh, creating doom and destruction. Mordor, Mor Mordor is alive and well. You know? it certainly is. So that has worked for us, a, a, a corporation divestment campaign, shareholders campaign. That's one thing. Then other is non violent direct actions. Like this is a direct action. Mm -hmm. Going to Washington, D.C. and standing with Bill McGibbon at the 350.org, putting a human rights face to the issue. So that's those are the tactics that we have used. Um.